Fresh Image. Fresh Image is a nonprofit Catholic ministry committed to providing individuals and communities with resources to facilitate the full flourishing of the image of God in each and every single human person. Not only will you find hundreds of articles, convenient audios and presentations on our beautiful faith, but also catechetical resources to be used in the classroom, at the parish, and at the kitchen table. Today, we are happy to present Fresh Image Gospel Reflections from our founder, Tony Crescio. Tony reminds us that it is when we look into the mirror of Scripture that we discover the unique image of God we have each been created to be. My dear friends in Christ, after just several short weeks of ordinary time, we find ourselves amid yet another transition between liturgical seasons, arriving today at the first Sunday of Lent. That said, the commencement of the season of Lent is very much in continuity with and builds upon what we have learned during the weeks of ordinary time just celebrated. For, as has been emphasized repeatedly, during the early weeks of ordinary time, the Church helped us get back to the basics of human life generally and the Christian life more specifically. One point that was emphasized in our discussions during those weeks was the continuity in the dynamics between God's act of creation and salvation. This became especially apparent in our conversation on the sixth Sunday of Ordinary Time when we discussed what authentic imitation of Christ is. As discussed then, authentic imitation of Christ is never merely mechanical, but always participatory. The basic theology of authentic imitation of Christ draws the orders of creation and salvation together. As creatures, we exist by way of participation in the life of the Creator, which Christianity reveals to be the triune God. Specifically, creatures come into existence and are upheld in existence by way of participating in the life of God through the eternal Word of God, the second person of the Trinity, the Son. Thus, in his famous prologue, John the Evangelist writes that all things came to be through the Word, and without him, nothing came to be. St. Paul echoes this theology in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17 of his letter to the Colossians, writing, For in him were created all things in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Theologically speaking, the idea here is that creatures are upheld in existence and move towards their perfection by way of participatory imitation of the eternal Son within the triune life that is God. The fall, however, disrupts all of this. By freely rejecting loving relationship with God, the source and sustainer of life, the human family tumbles towards death. It was fitting then that the Son, the divine person through whom creation was accomplished and in whom creation was to be perfected, should be sent by God to enable creatures to participate in the life of God once again. The incarnation and paschal mystery of the eternal Son accomplishes just this. However, as before, such only takes place when the human creature freely accepts the gift of salvation and cooperates with divine grace so as to maintain communion with God through, with, and in the Son. The season of Lent liturgically memorializes the saving work of God. Here the word memorial ought to be understood in the technical sense signified by the Greek term anamnesis. What this means is that Lent not only provides us with an opportunity to recollect God's saving action, but re-presents it liturgically. St. Augustine of Hippo puts it this way in Sermon 206, Life in this world is the time of our humility and is signified by these days, when Christ the Lord, who suffered once by dying, is so to say going to suffer again for us, as this solemnity comes round again every year. What happened once in the whole of time, that our life might be renewed, is celebrated every year, in order to be kept fresh in our memories. This is a crucial distinction, for were Lent a mere act of recollection, the best we could hope for is to play the role of spectator, witnessing God's action from afar historically by hearing the gospel accounts proclaimed to us. However, the liturgical representation of the saving work of God affords us the opportunity to participate in these events by recommitting ourselves to cooperating with God's grace in our lives. How do we do this? By imitating Christ, the Word who became flesh, that we might once again be availed a share in the divine nature as St. Peter teaches us in his second epistle. 
Each year, we hear one of the Synoptic Gospels telling of Christ's temptation in the desert on the first Sunday of Lent. One important reason for this speaks to what has just been discussed. All three Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, agree that Jesus fasted in the desert for 40 days. In its structure of 40 days, the season of Lent in itself is an imitation of this experience of our Lord. By structuring a liturgical season in this way, the Church very clearly is exhorting us to a participatory imitation of this experience of Christ in our own time and place. What's more, the season of Lent itself provides an excellent example of how authentic imitation is not mere mechanical replication. Who amongst us does the Church expect to literally go out into a desert and spend 40 days fasting? None. Yet, we are indeed being exhorted to participate in this event of Christ's life by way of imitation. Some elements of our imitation of Christ will be shared, and others completely unique to us. The season of Lent itself being one element that is shared by the Church Universal, and there are several other elements that will be shared amongst us as we will discuss in due course. However, it is important that we explore the why of Lent before we get there. Meaning, why does the church exhort us to a participatory imitation of Christ's experience in the desert during these next six weeks in the first place? An excellent way to explore the why of Lent is by our first reading for today, from the book of Genesis. Our first reading for today comes from chapter 9, verses 8 to 15 of Genesis. The exchange recounted between God and Noah takes place soon after the end of the Great Flood, which, we are told, lasted 40 days. In terms of our discussion for today, it is important to see that the lives of Noah and his family members mark a new point in history, a reset for the human family, if you will. As the only representatives of the human family left after the flood, God enters into a covenantal relationship with Noah in today's reading. God says to Noah and his sons, See, I am now establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that was with you all that came out of the ark. In the section previous to this, God had laid out the terms of this covenant in language echoing the words spoken to Adam and Eve at the beginning, be fertile and multiply and fill the earth. The similarity indicates the new beginning for the human family Noah and his family represent. But importantly, God adds a few details to this new covenant, including a special protection for the human creature. God says to Noah, Anyone who sheds the blood of a human being, by a human being shall that one's blood be shed. For in the image of God have human beings been made. Be fertile then, and multiply, abound on earth, and subdue it. God makes clear that this new beginning has to do with this covenantal relationship he enters into with Noah. God says, I will establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all creatures be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Importantly, God gives a sign to Noah of this covenant, the rainbow. God says, I set my bow in the clouds to serve as a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and every living creature. From then on, for God's people, the rainbow is a sign of God's loving concern and protection for the human family a sign of his desire for good for the human family, that they might have life to its fullest as creatures created in his image and likeness. From the time of the New Testament, Christian thinkers read the story of Noah and the flood as prefiguring the sacrament of baptism. We see this in our second reading for today from chapter 3 of the first epistle of St. Peter. After mentioning Noah's building of the ark in verse 20, St. Peter comments on this episode of salvation history, writing, This prefigured baptism, which saves you now, it is not a removal of dirt from the body, but an appeal to God for a clear conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The description of baptism as an appeal to God for a clear conscience may throw us off a bit, but need not. What Peter is telling us is simply that the sacrament of baptism sets things right between ourselves and God, such that we are no longer guilty, but are free from sin. Having sacramentally participated in the death and resurrection of Christ, we die to sin and live for God in Christ Jesus, as St. Paul teaches us in chapter 6 of his letter to the Romans. Accordingly, just as the flood meant a new beginning and an opportunity to experience life to the full for the human family, 
Being united to Christ through baptism makes us members of the people of God, the family of God. The Catechism puts it this way in paragraph 804, citing Lumen Gentium and Agentus from the Second Vatican Council. One enters into the people of God by faith and baptism. All men are called to belong to the new people of God, so that in Christ men may form one family and one people of God. The season of Lent has traditionally been, and still is, the time of year when catechumens are making their final preparations to be baptized into the church, the family of God, at the Easter Vigil. Thus, during the season of Lent, the church calls those who are already baptized to renew their baptismal commitment as others prepare to be baptized through the rite of Christian initiation of adults. Lent should therefore be seen and approached as a time when we recommit ourselves and strive to deepen our covenantal relationship with God. How do we do this? We go to the desert. By making the connection between baptism and our Lenten journey at the outset, the Church is helping us in our effort to imitate Christ over the course of these 40 days. In all three Synoptic Gospels, Jesus has this 40-day desert experience immediately after being baptized in the Jordan by John the Baptist. What's more, all three Synoptic Gospels tell us that Jesus was driven into the desert by the Holy Spirit. This is an important detail. It is, of course, the Holy Spirit who comes to dwell within us in the sacrament of baptism, unites us to Christ, and makes us adopted sons and daughters of God. Thus, in terms of the discussion at hand, being told that it is the Holy Spirit who drives Jesus into the desert towards this experience, Scripture frames our 40-day Lenten journey as a cooperative effort with the interior action of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in the first instance, we will only be able to deepen our covenantal relationship with God over the next 40 days by cooperating with the action of the Holy Spirit. But we can get more specific in terms of how it is that we will deepen our covenantal relationship with God during this Lenten season. In verse 12 of chapter 1 of Mark's Gospel, we are told that Jesus remained in the desert for 40 days, tempted by Satan. The way this reads in English makes it seem as if Jesus was constantly harassed by Satan over the course of these 40 days. We may easily imagine that Jesus' experience in the desert was filled with the sorts of temptations the Gospels of Matthew and Luke reveal to us. However, a closer look at Mark's account puts a bit of a different spin on Jesus' time in the desert. The Greek word translated as tempted here is parazo. However, as scripture scholar Brendan Byron points out, this Greek word can also be translated as tested, and if understood this way, provides us a different way to read this episode that gives us unique insights. When read this way, Jesus' experience in the desert is easily connected to the desert experience of the people of Israel, which we are told lasted 40 years. Accordingly, to see why it is that the Holy Spirit drives Jesus in the desert to be tested, we can see what Scripture tells us about Israel's desert experience. In chapter 8 of the book of Deuteronomy, the people of Israel are on the verge of taking possession of the promised land, which comes with great difficulty. Thus, in Deuteronomy, Moses is reminding the people of what their covenantal relationship with God entails and amidst doing so, reminds them of the 40-year desert experience they had just undergone as a people. In verse 2, Moses says, Remember how for these 40 years the Lord your God has directed all your journeying in the wilderness, so as to test you by affliction, to know what was in your heart, to keep his commandments or not. And among other things, Moses tells them that God allowed them to be hungry at times, so that the people would learn that it is not by bread alone that people live, but by all that comes forth from the mouth of the Lord. And in verse 5, Moses adds, So you must know in your heart that even as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. What God once did with his people Israel, whom Scripture likens to a son, he now does with the incarnate son. Just as Israel's disciplining in the desert took place just previous to the beginning of their mission of taking possession of the promised land, so too, Jesus' disciplining took place just previous to beginning his three-year public ministry. In both cases, God is preparing his children for a mission. A couple of important questions arise at this time. First, we might ask why the incarnate Son of God needs testing or disciplining. The answer impresses upon us Jesus' humanity. 
The Gospels of Matthew and Luke impress this upon us by telling us that after fasting, Jesus was hungry. But Mark seems to be taking a different tack. By framing this episode as a time of disciplining, Mark is suggesting to us that Jesus is undergoing a period of training. In chapter 2 of his Gospel, after relating the episode of the boy Jesus in the temple, Luke notes, And Jesus advanced in wisdom and age and favor before God and man. I think much of the time we just imagine Jesus as not quite a human being, as someone who didn't really have to grow or learn in any real sense because he was God. But such would undermine the fullness of his humanity as incarnate son, which would in turn undermine his ability to save everything that we are and experience as human beings, as the fathers of the church repeatedly point out. Growth and learning are a normal and important part of the life of the human creature and thus, It's important that the Son of God shares this experience with us. The book of Hebrews also speaks to this quality of the incarnate Son's life in chapter 5, verse 8, when it reveals to us that, Son though he was, Christ learned obedience from what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The time in the desert is part of Jesus' discipline and obedience, so that when the time came, He would be in perfect harmony with the Father's will to offer himself up for the salvation of this world that he so loves. God desires us to undergo a period of training during these 40 days as well. But a second important question arises at this point. What mission is God preparing us for? A twofold mission. First, by virtue of our baptisms, as Christians we have been made members of the body of Christ. God's sacrament of salvation in the world, as the Second Vatican Council teaches us in Lumen Gentium. Second, we live as God's sacrament of salvation in the world precisely by living the created missional identities that God has given uniquely to each of us as creatures created in His image. Each human creature is a completely unique reflection of God's life when it lives in communion with God and in accordance with His mission for each. Living as a broken human creature in a broken world, living out our created missional identities is difficult for two basic reasons. First, intellectually, the world challenges the idea that we have been created on purpose with a purpose, that God has graced each of us with a completely unique identity and mission and instead constantly tells us that we are to create our own purpose and identity. Secondly, while baptism cleanses us from original sin, it does not eliminate our tendency to sin, known as concupiscence. We can think of concupiscence as a sort of weakness of the will. Thus, we have to work at strengthening our souls in order to live out God's unique purpose for us to the best of our ability. Traditionally, the church gives us a three-part regimen as part of our Lenten discipline. We are to pray, fast, and give alms. Notice, please, that all three are imitations of Christ. In the desert episode, we see Christ fast, and the Gospels are filled with moments where Jesus retires to pray to his heavenly Father during the night. But how does Jesus give alms? The word alms has its origin in the Greek elios, which means compassion or mercy. The entire life of the incarnate Son is an act of God's mercy, an act of divine almsgiving providing the human family and each of its members with an opportunity to be reunited to its loving creator and thereby experience full flourishing, as God had indicated in the covenant with Noah, of which the rainbow appears in the sky to this day as a reminder. Our Lenten discipline thus begins and revolves around this threefold imitation of Christ, but I want to suggest that we can get even more specific and concrete. In Sermon 206, St. Augustine compares the whole of life to the season of Lent, a desert time when we are in exile away from our heavenly homeland and suffer all sorts of trials and temptations. The season of Lent is meant to remind us of this reality, and given what has been discussed today, it is also a season meant to discipline us, to train us to make this journey through life in covenantal relationship with God so as to one day reach the heavenly kingdom. But for personal and societal reasons, some of which have been mentioned, this journey is a hard one. And therefore we must train so as to develop the strength necessary to make the journey successfully.
The soul requires training to develop spiritual strength, no less than the body requires exercise to stay healthy and strong. The strengths of the soul are called virtues. The word virtue comes from the Latin virtus, which can also be translated as strength. The Holy Spirit bestows both the theological and moral virtues upon us at baptism precisely by uniting us to Christ, who St. Paul tells us in his first letter to the Corinthians is the virtue and wisdom of God. By uniting us to Christ, then, the Holy Spirit provides us with the virtue, the very strength of God to live so as to become the creature God created us to be. But this is not a one-and-done matter. Rather, like any muscle, these spiritual strengths must be exercised in order to remain strong and grow in conformity to Christ as we make our journey home. Lent, these 40 days in the desert, where we focus more intensely on and devote more time to prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, is the perfect time to allow God to train us and develop these spiritual strengths in us. My friends, this weekend the Holy Spirit drives us into the desert for a 40-day period of discipline. It is a time when God desires to prepare us, just as He did the people of Israel and Jesus, for the mission He has created us for. At baptism, God gifted us with the strength, the virtue necessary for carrying out our mission. But over time, we grow slack in maintaining this virtue, our share in the life of the Incarnate Son. Lent is a time to be re-strengthened for mission. Accordingly, I would suggest that this Lent, we might focus less on giving up something and more on gaining something. What I mean is, do an examination of conscience and identify a weakness that really needs to be overcome if you are to become the creature God has created you to be. If you're like me, you will have more trouble limiting yourself to one than finding one. Then, pick the virtue, the spiritual strength that overcomes that weakness to work on over the course of these next 40 days. If your weakness is making sure that things are done your way, work on obedience. If you tend to live as though you're in complete control of life, work on humility. If it is difficult for you to live out your faith in public, work on courage. The list goes on. Next, through the season of Lent, pray to God to bless you with this virtue and prayerfully dedicate the periods of fasting towards expanding a desire, a hunger, for this virtue. Finally, find a work of mercy that exercises the virtue you have chosen and dedicate yourself to practicing this work repeatedly over the next 40 days. If we allow God to train us in this way, we will be prepared to celebrate Easter Sunday with intense joy as we will arrive at the empty tomb with renewed life in the Incarnate Son and reinvigorated to do our part in bringing God's saving love to our broken world. Thank you for listening to this week's Gospel Reflection. For more resources, please visit us at freshimage.org. And remember, when you live a fresh life, you will be a breath of God's fresh, life-giving air to the world.